Everything in tennis comes down to timing. Your forehand, your backhand, your volleys, even your serve. And every single shot that you hit is just a little bit different. And that's what makes tennis so hard. Good timing is really what separates higher level players from lower level players. Unfortunately, it's one of the hardest things to fix. This is why you see players take lessons for years without really improving all that much. It's why people watch YouTube video after YouTube video about hitting the ball like Federer in three simple steps, and they kind of understand how it should work. They understand all the different pieces of the puzzle, but then when they try it, it just doesn't work for them. It's all about timing. So what I'm gonna do in this video is explain to you how timing works, which aspects of it are important, what prevents you from having good timing. I'm going to take you through a series of assessments so you can start to figure it out and then talk about how to train these things to fix issues so that you can have better timing and develop high level strokes. Okay, so providing you're ready and set up in the right position early enough, let's break down how timing works and what holds you back. It's all about being able to judge the speed of the ball is traveling at and how far the ball is away so that you can start your swing at the right time and then so that you can adjust the speed of your swing in relation to the ball that's coming towards you. On the visual side of things, you need to be able to judge how far the ball is away and how fast it's traveling so you can start your swing at the right time. We're gonna forget about court surface for now. We're gonna forget about the amount of spin. So we're taking those out of it. We're just on about how far it is away and how fast it's traveling. If the ball is closer to, the, to you than you think, so the ball is further on in that direction than you think if you're hitting a forehand, it's gonna mean that you start your swing a little bit late. This is gonna cause you to be rushed on your shot. That's why you see people kind of arming the ball and not able to hit through the ball. That's why you see people pulling off and you see all these different adaptions that are so hard to fix with coaching because the issue is starting the swing a little bit too late. We've got exactly the same thing going on if the ball is traveling faster than you thought because again, it's gonna come on to you quicker than you thought and that's when you're gonna be rushed and you're gonna do all these different things. But we get the same thing going on in reverse. If the ball is further away than you thought or it's traveling a little bit uh, more slowly than you thought, that's when players tend to start to over-rotate. They're again trying to compensate. They, they realize that it's not quite where they thought it was. They over-rotate on their shots. And again, that's why it's so hard to fix that sort of issue. So it's gonna be exactly the same on the forehand and the backhand, but obviously now we're thinking about a ball coming from that direction. It's still, if it's closer than you thought, you're gonna be late, you're gonna be arming it. If it's further away, you're gonna be over-rotating. And then we've got the movement side of things. Even if you start your swing at theoretically the right time, you've then got to be able to control your body. You've got to be able to control the sequence of body movements in relation to the speed of the ball. Now, we've already said that we're set up in the right position. So for all the strokes, there's some kind of unit turn. The racket tends to start higher. Then it's about initiating the swing at the right time. So driving through your back or your outside hip at the same time that the racket drops. So then you can use the torso rotation, let the arm come through and then the racket come through. It's gonna be exactly the same thing on the back end, both for the single hander. We're still driving off the outside or back leg as we do the racket drop into the slot position. And then we've got the rotation and the arm coming through. Same thing on the double hander. And it's actually the same thing on the slice, but it just looks a little bit different. So you have to start the swing at the right time. And then based on the speed that the ball's traveling at, you have to be able to sequence those body movements in the right order and at the right speed. So we've got those two components. We've got the visual component, and now we've got the coordination component. And what I've found after assessing hundreds of players over the last five or six years, when players have issues with timing, they generally have issues with both the visual component and the coordination component. So what I'm gonna do is take you through a series of assessments to help you, help you figure out what's going on in your body. So I'm gonna take you through two different vision assessments that are gonna be really important for your ability to judge the speed the ball's traveling at and the distance it is away. There's a lot more assessments that we could do, but these are the easiest ones for you to do on your own. And then I'm gonna take you through four different coordination assessments. We're gonna do assessments for different parts of the body and we're gonna be assessing both sides of the body. As we go through the assessments, I'm gonna be explaining why they're so important in terms of your timing 
But one thing that I need to talk about before you do them is how you approach these assessments. You need to have a learner's mindset and an improver's mindset. There's normally a very big difference working with higher level players and lower level players. When I take higher level players through these sorts of assessments, they're trying to find problems and things that they can improve on. And that's what allows them to continually improve. What I find a lot of the time with lower level players is they don't like to have problems. They like to pretend that everything's okay and they kind of shy away from problems. That's the wrong way to approach these assessments. You're gonna go through them, follow the instructions really carefully, pay attention to the coaching points, and try and identify even relatively small errors within the assessments because it's finding those small things, but normally they're very large things, it's finding those things that's then gonna allow you to improve. Now what I recommend is that you record yourself doing the assessments because sometimes players don't have a very good awareness of what's going on in their body. So especially with the coordination assessments, I've done it a lot of times where I'm standing in front of someone watching them do the assessment and the coordination is really, really bad and people can't necessarily tell it. They've got really good coordination on one side, really bad coordination on another side, which is a big thing we need to address for timing and they're not able to tell. So it's really important that you do these assessments properly and I really highly recommend recording yourself so you can watch them back and see what they look like. Assessment number one is a vision assessment. This is a really important visual skill for your ability to judge the speed the ball is traveling at and how far the ball is away. We're also assessing a part of the brain that's really important for your spatial awareness in general, which is essential for those things that I've just talked about. And it's essential for your ability to prepare early and read where the ball's going. So this one visual assessment tells us a lot of information. It's a really simple assessment, but I find a lot of players get this wrong and they miss out on really big errors. So you definitely want to record yourself doing this and you do exactly what I'm doing now. I've got a camera set up right in front of me and then you can watch it back and see what's going on. So I've got a pen. I'm trying to be in the tip of the pen right in between my eyes to the bridge of my nose. Now, I know that when you play tennis, the ball doesn't get this close to you. I'm very aware of it, but this is a skill that you should be able to do. And if you can't do it, it indicates a big problem with this particular part of the brain. And as I said, it's really important for timing for the reasons that I've outlined. So you'll hold the pen at arm's length, focus on the tip of the pen, slowly bring it in, and you're trying to take the tip of the pen right in between your eyes. So it's right in between my eyes. It's not down there. It's not up there. If we take it higher or lower, it's assessing a slightly different thing. You've got to get it right in between your eyes. Now, as the pen gets up close, so you get it in there, it's going to go a little bit blurry. Blurriness is okay. What we're looking for is if the tip of the pen splits in two because your eyes move inwards together. Each eye is like a camera lens. So as the target moves towards you, both camera lens is pointing at it. If one of the eyes doesn't come inward properly, at a certain point, the tip of the pen is gonna start to split in two because your eyes are gonna be looking in a slightly different place. So what you're gonna do is bring it in slowly and you do need to go slowly because where players go wrong with this is they go too fast, one eye is looking at it, one eye is looking in the opposite direction, and they think they're doing it perfectly when there's a major issue with this visual skill. That's why you want to record it. But go slowly, see if you can notice the point at which it starts to double. You should be able to get it all the way in, and you should be able to hold it there for, you know, two, three, four, five seconds without any problems. It doesn't split. Both eyes are still pointing at the target, and it's going to be really obvious when you watch it on camera. Now, what will happen for most of you is it'll double at a certain distance. It might be an inch, it might be two inch, it might be three inches. The further away it is, the bigger the problem it indicates, but any deficits at all indicate a problem. And if you look at me and you watch my left eye closely, I can get it all the way in and I can hold it here for 10 seconds, no problem, but my left eye isn't quite as good as my right eye. So although I fix most of my issues with this, I've still got a tiny little issue, so I've still got a long way to improve. So do this assessment, see what happens, record yourself. Can you get it all the way in without the tip of the pen doubling? Watch it back and see where your eyes are pointing. The second assessment is going to be another vision assessment, and here we're assessing for two different things. We're assessing for something called visual suppression. Now, as I've just talked about, both eyes are camera lenses, and the way our brain accurately judges how far things are away from each other is it compares the image from both of your eyes together and kind of blends them together. And that's what allows you to have really good distance judgment and depth perception. If your brain can't use the image from both eyes equally, that's called visual suppression, and obviously it's going to be a huge problem for your timing. 
The second thing that we're going to be assessing with this assessment is eye alignment. And if your eyes aren't quite pointing at the target in the way that you think they are, that's going to cause huge problems for timing, ball tracking, consistency, and just everything that you do on court. So really useful assessment. Um, we're going to use a bit of string with beads on it. So the fancy name for this is a Brock string. You can buy them really cheaply on Amazon, or you can make them yourself, or you can just get a bit of string and tie a knot in it. But then once you've done that, the official Brock string has three different beads on, so different colors, and we normally assess visual suppression at different distances. But here, I'm just gonna show you the assessment at one distance. I'm just gonna use the yellow bead, because obviously that's the color of the ball. And the distance that we're gonna go for is gonna be a contact point distance. So I'm just gonna set things up. So if I'm imagining if I'm hitting a forehand, so maybe that's going to be about my contact point distance. That's where it would be. We're going to assess that distance. I'm then going to hold the string. I'm just wrapping my finger over, wrapping it over my finger. I'm going to hold it like this. And then I'm going to do the assessment with my eyes looking directly at that bead. And what I should see are two strings going directly into the center of the yellow bead. The reason I see two strings is because, like I've just said, both eyes are different camera lenses. So my right eye sees a string and my left eye sees a string. It's actually the other way around that you would think just because of what the brain does with visual information. So the string coming from the right is my left eye and the string coming from the left is my right eye. But what we should see is that both strings go into the center of the bead and they're an even level of brightness. We should also see two strings coming out of the center of the bead that are an even level of brightness. If one of the strings is darker, one of the strings is lighter, that indicates visual suppression. It indicates that your brain isn't able to use both of the image, images quite as clearly. So if the string on the right is really bright and the string on the left is less bright and it's kind of appearing and disappearing and doing strange things like that, it means you've got visual suppression. So if the left one is faded, that's your right eye that's suppressed. If the right one is faded, that's your left eye that's suppressed. Now, people can have strange things happen. Sometimes one string will be bright and then it'll switch to the other one. And depending on how they focus and what they do, it changes around. Sometimes most of the string will be bright and then there'll be a chunk of the string missing. Anything other than two strings of equal brightness going into the center of the bead and out of the bead indicates visual suppression. So that's the first part of the assessment. The second part is going to be the alignment. It should be going directly into the center of the bead. What happens for a lot of people is it crosses just before the bead or just after the bead. And if that's happening, it indicates a slight eye alignment issue where your eyes aren't quite pointing at the target in the way they're meant to. So that's what the assessment does. That's what we're looking for. How bright are the beads? And are they pointing directly at the target? And again, I find these is one of, this is one of those assessments where initially people don't do it very well. They're like, yeah, I can see both beads. But then when you ask them more questions about it, then they're like, oh, oh, yeah, actually it's fading in and out. So it's not whether you can see both strings if you try and you switch your eyes between the two. You're looking directly at the target and it should be both strings of an even level of brightness. So I've just demonstrated that at contact point distance, but it's also a really good idea to test it further away and closer. So depending how long your string is, maybe 8, 10, 12 feet away, the reason that you want to test there is because you need to be able to process both images accurately to just the distance of the ball so you can start your swing at the right time. But you also want to test it up closer to help figure out eye alignment issues. Obviously, the ball isn't going to get six inches from your nose, but it's a really good way to figure out if your eyes are able to coordinate with each other and point at the target properly. We're now going to do four different coordination assessments. We're going to be assessing four different parts of the body that are all really important for your ability to control your strokes and to have good timing. And we're looking for a couple of different things in terms of the assessments. Firstly, we're comparing right side to left side, both with the upper body and lower body. We need balance between the sides. So if one of your sides of your body is coordinated and the other one isn't as coordinated, that is gonna create huge problems for your timing. And this is a mistake that I see a lot of lower level players make. The right side's okay, the left side's not as good. So they go, oh, that's all right. I'm right-handed, not left-handed, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. It matters in a big way. This is the stuff that we're looking for. Having good timing, 
you need balance between coordination on both sides because both of the sides of your body look together. So that's the first thing we're looking for. But then in terms of the actual movements themselves, we're looking at things in two different ways. We're looking at the accuracy of the movement and we're looking at the rhythm, timing, speed of the movement. Just like we do with tennis strokes, you need accurate movements. You need to be able to control your body parts. You need to be able to control the angle of your racket face at the moment of contact. So the accuracy of movements is important, but you also need to be able to control the rhythm of the speed. So on your strokes, but for these assessments as well. So we've got those two things. We've got the accuracy and the rhythm of the movements and we're comparing both of those things. How are they on the right side compared to how are they on the left side? For the first assessment, we're gonna be assessing rapid pronation and supination. So flipping your hand up and down like that, which initially might not sound like a big deal for you, but if you understand tennis biomechanics well, this is a huge deal. Pronation is what you use to get the top spin on your forehand. Supination is what you'll be using to get the top spin on your backhand. Pronation is what allows you to get the power and the control on your serve. So this movement, we are assessing the parts of the brain that create and coordinate the movement that allows you to control the angle of your racket head and in large part, the control the amount of spin that you've got on your shots. So this is a really important assessment to do well. The assessment itself looks like this. I'm gonna have my left hand out in front. I'm gonna be testing my right hand. Both elbows are gonna be in at my side. I'm gonna be trying to hit the front and back of my hand like this. Now, when I hit this, I'm hitting the palm of my hand. So I'm hitting the front and back of the palm of my hand on the palm of my hand. And I'm giving you these instructions really specifically because we want to try and standardize the test. What happens a lot of the time when people do this, they try and cheat, they try and do it as quickly as they can. They start to fold the arm up and they flip between the two hands like this and go, yes, I'm doing a really good job. No, left palm stays flat. I'm testing the right hand. I'm hitting front and back of the palm of the hand. I'm trying to keep this hand still. It will move a little bit because I'll be hitting it, but I'm trying to see how quickly I can do this with the right hand. The elbows are staying into the side. I'm not squeezing them. I'm just holding it there because what I don't want you doing is flippering the arm in and out like this because that's a form of cheating. But the assessment, front and back of the palm of the hand, and you can see how quickly and accurately you can do it on the right hand, how quickly and accurately you can do it on the left hand. I would test it a couple of times to see how it gets on. And what you're looking for is, you know, is it accurate? Am I able to flip it over or do I hit the side of the hand? I'm trying to hit the palm of the hand. Do I, do I hit the fingers? Am I doing strange things? Can I not do it without my elbow moving? So that's what we're looking for in terms of the accuracy. When it comes to the speed, what we're looking for is, what is it like right to left? Is it okay for a second and really good? And then I get tired and then I start making mistakes. Is the right hand really slow and the left hand's really fast? What have we got going on? So test it maybe two or three times on each side to see what happens. We're now gonna do a really similar looking assessment, but instead of going from the forearms and the wrists, we're now looking at the shoulders. So how quickly and accurately can you internally and externally rotate your shoulders? And hopefully now it's making sense what we're kind of looking for here. We're assessing the parts of the brain that create and coordinate your internal and external rotation. And again, in terms of topspin on your forehand, especially if you've got more of a straight arm type forehand, the level and speed and accuracy of your internal rotation is gonna be important. For the two-handed backhands, gonna be important on the left side. We're also, for the left side of the body, the coordination of this is gonna be really important for your ball toss. So this video isn't so much about it, but hopefully this is making sense with testing your coordination. And what we should see is the same thing side to side. So. For the coordination, you're gonna hold your arm out in front. I'm gonna keep my elbow locked and I'm just gonna rotate as fast as I can. I'm trying to get my palm all the way over, all the way over, all the way over. And we're trying to do it like that. And we're seeing what happens with the movement. So firstly, can you get it all the way over? That's the accuracy of the movement without the shoulder blade lifting. A lot of the time people do this sort of thing and the whole spine's moving. So we should be able to keep the shoulder blade down and just twist from the shoulder. Does your arm stay straight or do you have to keep trying to bend it to do it? Notice I've got my thumb and my fingers together. What's happening with the hand? Does it start flippering and doing strange things like that? Or does it stay in the same place and it's just a nice, clean, internal and external rotation? 
You're then going to compare the same thing on the other side. Fingers and thumb together, elbow straight, the shoulder blade is staying still, and we've got that nice, clean, internal and external rotation of the whole arm. So palm down, palm up, palm down, palm up. And then you can compare side to side. What's the accuracy of the movement like? Does one side kind of flipper everywhere, everywhere and the other one's perfectly smooth? Is one side really quick and the other one is really slow? Compare accuracy and speed side to side. We're now gonna move down to the lower body and start with the hips and we're gonna test internal and external rotation. And hopefully this stuff is making sense to you by now. We're assessing the parts of the brain that create and coordinate movement and with the lower body, Balance side to side is really important, especially on the hips. This is kind of one of the big things when it comes to timing. As I rotate into my forehand, as I drive through my leg, my right hip externally rotates, my right hip internally rotates. It's gonna be opposite for my backhand. So we need the coordination between the two. They both need to be accurate and they both need to have good rhythm. The assessment itself, really simple. I want you to hold on to something. I want it to be a coordination assessment, not a balance assessment. So I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna be internally and externally rotating my right leg. I'm raising it forward just a little bit, so it's not too far, just a little bit, nice and comfortable. I'm holding onto my pelvis to make sure it's staying still because for accuracy, we want two things. We want, can the actual leg rotate? So the pelvis is staying still, it's just the leg. I'm not kind of twisting my whole body and my spine isn't moving. It's just the leg twisting in the hip socket. And then we're also looking, can I keep it straight when I rotate it? So I shouldn't be doing this with the leg weaving in and out. It's not the ankle or it's not just the ankle. It's the whole leg twisting in and out. So you test it holding onto your pelvis. Then I would hold on, test the other leg holding onto the pelvis. But if I do it facing you, so now I'm going to go for the same thing, making sure this pelvis isn't moving, just twisting my leg. So that's the movement. Now you're going to see how quickly you can go on the right side, how quickly can you go on the left side. And I find this is a big one for people to record so they can see what's going on. Okay, final assessment is going to be for the feet. Again, we're going to compare side to side and hopefully it makes sense to you how important having coordinated feet is for your footwork because again, you need to be nice and light on your toes. You need to have set up in the right position and you need to be driving through your leg to initiate your swing. The assessment is going to be really simple. It's just going to be foot tapping. So I'm going to place my foot out in front of me. I'm going to tap it as quickly as I can. So when I do this, I'm just placing it in front all of my weight is still on my left leg, so I'm not leaning onto my right leg. I'm just having my heel on the ground and just tapping the foot as quickly as I can. I'm gonna compare that on the right side to the left side, just tapping the foot as quickly as I can. Again, you're gonna go for about five seconds. And in terms of the accuracy, you want to make sure that most of the movement is just coming from your ankle. So I shouldn't be driving it with my whole body. It should just be from the ankle, so I'm pulling up with the muscles in the front of my shin, and then I'm lowering it down with the muscles on the back of my leg. Same thing on the other side in terms of accuracy. And then in terms of the speed and the rhythm, can you go really quickly on both sides, or is one side really fast, one side is really slow? And do you maintain the rhythm, or is one side like do 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 do, and then it goes slowly for a second, then it goes fast, and then it goes slow? So check for the rhythm that way. And then the final thing that you wanna look out for is kind of fatigue in your shins. So as you do this, you shouldn't get loads of fatigue in your shins, you're just tapping your foot. If one of your shins gets really tired, that's also something that we're looking for. Okay, so they're the assessments that we've got. It's a really good idea to watch the instructions a couple of times to make sure that you're doing them properly. And like I said before, it's a really good idea to record yourself to watch them back. And if you'd like a little bit of help with that, um, I'll place a link down there and I'll place a link up there that's gonna allow you to schedule a free Zoom chat with me so I can help you go over them and figure out what's going on. So if you click on either of those two links, it's gonna take you over to a page, fill out the quick application, choose a time, and then we can chat that way. But what I wanna do now is talk about how to train this stuff so that you can improve both your vision and your coordination so that then you can have higher level timing and really start to progress your, progress your game. Okay, so the last thing I wanna do in this video is talk a little bit about training your visual system and training to improve coordination because both of these things are very trainable and if you want better timing, you wanna be able to use high level technique to really improve your game, that's what you're gonna to need to do. So in terms of the vision, um, we've just looked at specific issues that might be going on. You can often correct those issues or make a dent in it just by training that drill 
over and over again. But in terms of having high level timing, they aren't the only visual skills that go into it. There's a good chance that you need to work on some other stuff as well and really develop high levels of spatial awareness. But it's just a case of systematically practicing it. So we can do different eye tracking and different eye movement exercises to help improve your eye movements. We can use different types of chart drills and things like that to help you improve your spatial awareness. And doing those things on a consistent basis can really make a massive difference over time. When it comes to vision training, when you start doing it, you get results. But the longer you keep on doing it for, you can really kind of take yourself from where you're at now to develop a visual system that's going to allow you to play much higher level tennis. And it's going to be exactly the same for coordination. Coordination and movements are created in parts of the brain and they're coordinated in parts of the brain. And by systematically working on coordination, so you can actually try those different drills on a regular basis and that might be beneficial, but often with coordination you need to work on other stuff and you basically need to break movements down and systematically practice being coordinated. So potentially I could go for my wrist and I could practice making accurate wrist circles, working on that in different speeds, at different rhythms, making the circles in slightly different ways. And I know that sounds really strange, but if you do that consistently over time, I have personally seen it on myself, completely transform timing. And I've now seen it on a growing number of people that I've worked with transform their level of timing. But you just have to go through the body and kind of work at this stuff and progressively work on your coordination. And by doing that, you work on the visual system together, you work on the coordination together, and then stuff just starts to work better on court. Before, your coach gave you some advice and you couldn't quite execute it. Now, your coach tells you what to do and suddenly you're able to do it. But it's just about training the visual system, training the coordination, working on it consistently over time, and it can make a really big difference. Now, if you would like help with it, the best plan is to kind of go through the route that I've just mentioned, do those assessments, record yourself, um, schedule a chat with me we can go through them and I can help you to kind of figure out what's going on and talk about potential things that you can do to work on it in more detail